Hi. As part of the work I'm currently engaged in on the ventilators, I do need to have a little look at some solutions for a UPS module. So what we need is a system that can provide power in the event of a power outage, whether that be integrated batteries into the ventilator or an external solution like this. Now this is a trip light Omnix 350HG, which is one of the devices that I was evaluating. I don't actually think we'll go with something like this because it's a little bit unwieldy. But this is specifically a hospital grade UPS unit. So what that means is it meets the IEC 60601 medical regulations. Uh, partially that imposes some restrictions on the overall EMC limits. So we have slightly tighter, well considerably tighter EMC limits. So uh, both in terms of radiation, it needs to have much lower radiation limits than a standard piece of consumer equipment. But also in terms of immunity, there are higher levels that it needs to be able to cope with in order to pass those tests. In addition to that, there's some things around alarm systems. So you can see on the front of this device, uh, we've got four LEDs and we've got an alarm built in as well as a mute button and that forms part of the medical regulation. So in the event of a power outage, it will give an alarm and you can mute that alarm if you need to and it'll come back after a few minutes. In the event of a critical battery, that alarm will indicate a slightly different tone and that will alert the healthcare professional or whoever's in the room that this unit is about to fail and that it needs attention. On the back of the unit, there are a few different things that you wouldn't normally see on a standard IT UPS. First of all, this little thing here, which is an equipotential bonding point. So here's a close up of the terminal. And it's important to note that this isn't a safety earth. This doesn't provide any uh, earthing in the event of an electrical fault. What it does is it makes sure that all of the pieces of equipment in the vicinity of a patient are all connected together through a four millimeter connector that plugs on the top of this and four millimeter squared wire. And it means that the touch voltage between any simultaneously touchable devices can't raise high enough that it poses an electrical hazard to the patient or a healthcare professional. According to the instructions, these are special medical connectors. So we've got our AC input on an IEC flying lead. That is so that that can be strapped into place to prevent it accidentally getting unplugged. And then these go out to your various pieces of equipment. But supposedly these are made from special plastic that reduce the leakage current to less than 100 microamps. Now, I don't fully understand that because you wouldn't typically hook up a patient to the main supply. It would always be through some other piece of equipment that provides all of the isolation and everything that's needed. So I don't fully understand that clause. Inside the rear cover is the battery compartment. And this unit came shipped with two 6 volt 12 amp hour batteries connected in series to give a 12 volt supply. Unfortunately, this unit received quite a bit of damage in the post. There's a crack on the side here. And also the interconnecting wire that connects the two ends of the battery at this end somehow got completely ripped, which means that this really saw some considerable force because this cable isn't thin at all. This is really quite heavy duty. So when I first powered this unit up, it didn't work at all. Um, so that's not particularly good. And then there's this vented back cover just to release any gases that the lead acid batteries might produce. Also on the back of the unit is a little potentiometer which determines how sensitive this unit should be to distortions on the AC waveform. So this isn't a double conversion UPS. So normally what it'd be doing is charging the batteries and just passing through the AC straight onto the output connectors. And then in the event of a power outage or when it detects that the waveform isn't good, it then switches over to battery power and the inverter actually fires up. On the more expensive models, you have a double conversion. So you down convert to the 12 volt or 24 volts for the battery. And then the inverter is always running off battery so that you get a clean AC waveform on the output of the unit. So here's the inside of the unit and the first thing to notice when you have a little look is the AC supply comes in and goes to a double fused arrangement. So it's fusing both the live and the neutral and you still tend to see this quite a lot in medical equipment and I'm not really sure on the rationale behind this. It seems a little bit bizarre that they still do this but uh, that's the way it is anyway. Um, and then it goes through a little differential mode choke. So that's probably one part of your EMC. Um, so yeah, it just goes through this choke that's got about 10 turns on it and then goes off to the main board. Coming back from the UPS unit, it just connects straight onto the IEC sockets at the back 
and then at the end here is a little block. And so what we had inside that sleeve was a little metal oxide varistor to clamp any over voltages on the output and also a little snubber arrangement to also help with the transients. Here we have our big transformer made in China and what we have here is the two thick windings. These are obviously our modulated DC input to the transformer but probably what it's doing is it will have an AC winding that will go in here and what that will do is when it's providing mains it will also be using this same transformer to charge the battery and then in the event of a mains failure there will be a relay or something that disconnects the mains input and then it works in the opposite direction so we get our modulated DC coming in and then we've got our two wires here that go straight off to the back panel as another set of windings in the transformer. What this probably means is that this transformer is actually performing isolation as well as doing all of the UPS work. So basically the outputs are probably not going to be connected to the mains input directly. It will always be through the conversion of the transformer. So here's our main PCB. It's a little bit of a mess and a few things that I don't like. First of all, we've got these unsheathed fast on connectors. This one in particular looks really badly crimped and also it does move around quite a lot and I could conceivably see that that ends up touching the heatsink here. But then if you have a look from this profile, we've got this ceramic wire round resistor with some cables next to it. It only takes a bit of movement and that's already touching the heatsink. So that's pretty crap as well. We're also seeing a fair amount of damage to these wires. The insulation's getting scraped off in a few places. And I've seen that a few times within this device, so uh, that's not particularly great either. We've got this mishmash of connectors. So we've got this one that goes onto a header on the PCB, but then this wire is soldered in and then connects to an inline connector. So I don't know why they didn't just put the right connector on the board instead of going to these flying leads. I don't know, it just seems a little bit uh, haphazard. We've got the main microcontroller for actually doing the UPS conversion just down here. And that's actually a PIC 16F73, so absolutely ancient 8-bit processor. I guess they uh, probably first designed their UPS ages ago and just decided never to play with this, so they've got a, you know, a really old picking there. The nice thing about microchip is they do always support their old microcontrollers, so you can still buy these even though it's about 25 years old. Uh, maybe not quite that old, but... Uh, Microchip do have really good back catalogue of parts that you can always use in your designs. You can see the capacitors are Jamicon capacitors, so, uh, you know, not the finest brand. They do do okay, and you see them in a fair amount of equipment. Also, generally speaking, just a lot of stuff flapping about in the breeze. So if we have a little look, um, we've got these TO220 parts. You know, that one's just moving around. We've got a couple here. That one's already been bent out of place. Glass fuses. Um, those appear to be all connected to the telecoms line. So this has the ability to filter the telecoms line, but it literally is only through these mobs and fuses. So not a lot going on there. Here's the back of the PCB, and it's clearly been wave soldered. You can tell by the design of the PCB and the way that the components are aligned. There's obviously been a few hand soldered parts on it as well but you can see it's got this really grotty conformal coating applied to this side it's not even at all uh, really not that good it looks like it's been sort of vaguely brushed on normally you get a really nice sheen across the PCB if it's been applied properly so that's pretty poor um, there's a USB connector on the back and that interfaces with this little PIC micro here so we've got a PIC 18F 14K50 which is actually a nice little microcontroller. It, you can get a USB stack for it and it's really nice and easy to interface with. Probably what they're doing is just interfacing with the other microcontroller through a UART connection and maybe it does a little bit more diagnostics built into that device, um, but probably pretty straightforward. I think what it will also do is through the USB connection allow things like computers to shut down gracefully and that kind of thing. Uh, one other thing that caught my eye is this really crap bit of soldering here. A look at that, that's basically uh, not made a connection at all with the blade fuse that's on the other side. So that's pretty poor. It's not flowed onto that connection at all. So that's a typical example of a dry joint. Also a bit of crap soldering going on here. Also you can see we've got some really bad hand soldering going on here. The joints haven't flowed very well at all. 
you can see we've got the factory connections that were done um, through the wave solder machine but then these ones that have been hand reworked are really poor and flux is still around there clearly rosin based because of the color and then not been cleaned off again a little bit more rework here on the other side is just two to 92 transistors this one's gone all right but this one's had to be hand reworked again so i don't know what's going on with their process it's pretty poor that something like this didn't manage to make it through without needing additional rework and look here's another one you can see all the soldering around it's absolutely fine but this one's needed rework on the connections here just a standard through hole capacitor not difficult to get right long leads hanging through here i mean this is um not very good at all really for a medical grade piece of equipment so I was just about to apply some Kapton tape to the heatsink to separate the resistor from it and I noticed if you look this is exactly what I was talking about it's exactly where that wire touches and clearly a fair amount of current has flown between that resistor leg and the heatsink causing a little crater to be blown out of the heatsink so I don't know like this is looking really poor so a view down from the top just shows how poor the design of this is there's absolutely no wiring management that's gone on so we've got our thick wire going from the transformer down here. So it scrapes against the heat sink on this little bit of insulation here. It's sort of pressed in between the transformer and the casework. So that's left that nice indent in the cable here. And then if you have a little bit of a further look down here, this earth cable is always going to push that resistor into the heat sink. And then everything's just stuffed down there wherever it will fit. Uh, you know, if you were designing this properly, You'd have it in such a way that when this slides in you just plug in the harness or plug in a couple of harnesses and everything's all in the right place but no this has just sort of been stuffed in the top here and all the wires just wherever they'll fit when the cover's closed all right so let's have a little look at what the output from the inverter actually looks like when it's running on battery okay so that's a little bit disappointing it's not an actual sine wave output it's just a modified sine wave so a square wave basically where the area under the curve is approximately equal to what it would have been if it was a full sine wave. So typically you would actually want a proper sine wave that has been created from a varying PWM waveform and then filtered after that. I'm not quite sure how they've got around these very sharp edges. And so what we're looking at here according to the picoscope is somewhere in the region of 10 microseconds rise time. That's about 100 kilohertz or so. So we would typically see that being radiated onto the output of the UPS. That means that you would then have that going into your system. And if you did the EMC test with this running on battery, you would very likely see quite a lot of that noise being radiated out from your own device just by virtue of being connected to this UPS. So overall, things aren't looking good for this UPS unit. As you saw, this is a really bad example of what a medical device should look like. Now, admittedly, this isn't a true medical device. It's not going to be connected to a patient directly. So this won't have gone through the same rigor of testing that a proper medical device that is connected to a patient would go through. But this is supposed to be designed for a hospital environment. And so you would expect that at least some care had been taken over the design of this unit, but it really looks like it's been thrown together by monkeys. The PCB design is terrible. There's components that can touch other components. They're all flapping about in the breeze. You saw that resistor that was touching the heat sink and some of the connectors on the unit, which could very easily end up touching the heat sink as well. So multiple points of failure. And then the cable management is just terrible. So because of the lack of PCB design that's gone in there, the wires are all over the place. It's just like no one has paid attention to what they're actually designing. On top of that, this isn't actually a cheap unit. So the fact that it's not got a sine wave output is also quite poor because that may end up affecting your device. When you design a piece of equipment, although you do harmonics testing and that kind of thing when it comes to EMC, you would expect a true sine wave input. So this may cause problems further down the line for connected equipment. So um, yeah, it's really not that good at all. Another problem is that we saw that this received some damage in shipping. Now the box was completely intact, which means that the packaging that this is in has also not been designed appropriately. So overall, you know, really not good at all. So the hunt goes on. Uh, we do probably have a solution that is much better than any of these types of things anyway. But hopefully you found the video useful and educational. And until next time, thanks for watching.